Well, this is quite the honor. Um, it's also a bit of a, a homecoming. I grew up in Queens, and I'd come look up at the blue whale and, and wonder how I'd be able to study natural history one day, and I get to do that now. And I want to talk about the power of, of exhibits like this one and the one that we're celebrating, but also the collections behind the scene that, we're, um, that really lead up to these exhibits. And I want to put that in terms of the big ocean myth. So what's the big ocean myth? It's that the oceans are big. So of course the oceans are big, right? They're, especially if we look at our blue planet from the Pacific side. But they might not be as big as you think. So if we look over our world, 70% of our Earth is covered by ocean. But perhaps they're not the boundless, endless depths that we think they are. Once we get off the continental shelf, it's about two miles deep on average, which is, you know, deep, but maybe not as deep as you thought. The deepest parts are about seven miles deep. And in fact, it's just an incredible thing for me. What would, we, what would it look like if we rolled it all up? It's not 20,000 leagues under the sea. The deepest it gets is two, two leagues. So let's roll it all up. This is from the US Geological Survey. All the world's water fits in this one 860-mile diameter sphere that barely covers the Midwest. That's all the world's water. All the water in the oceans, all the fresh water, which is also represented here, but included in the bigger ball, all the water that you're drinking, all the water that's in you, all, all your pet's water. So all in there. So this is how I think of the world's oceans, as something that's finite, something that can be destroyed, something that can be polluted. And we haven't, the reason that it seems like the world's oceans are endless is because so little of it has been explored. Before, you know, most of you in here probably have a screensaver that looks something like this. But few of us have seen images like this. And it's Sylvia Earle and, and Jacques Cousteau that introduced us to these oceans. And once we start talking about below 20 meters, we have to talk about these two gentlemen, William Beebe and Otis Burton who created this bathysphere. And this is in the 1930s, so this is the start of exploration of the deep sea. They went into this bathysphere famously a half mile down. They would joke, only dead men had gone deeper. So before Burton and Beebe, this is what the deep sea looked like, a vast void of black. That's what we thought it looked like. And they introduced us to this world of light and of life, chock full of life, in fact. And even images like this, I didn't have images like this in grad school. These are new. These are from Dante Fenelio, in situ images of deep sea creatures. That's a rare thing to get, but we're getting more and more of them. So we're still very much in the age of exploration of the deep sea. I moved from New York 10 years ago to Louisiana to start a curator position. And I thought, boy, I really hope they have a great international airport because I am not going to discover anything new here. Everything's in Africa or Asia, all these places far away where we've left everything undiscovered. I learned very quickly that we left undiscovered much of even the Gulf of Mexico. On my very first expedition out into the Gulf, we collected specimens of what turned out to be new species. So there were two new pancake batfishes right out in the Gulf on the, on the front steps of the US. So I was shocked to discover that, but not as shocked as we were about how totally unprepared we were for the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. We had very little baseline for what creatures were being lost or the population numbers or anything, really, when the 2010 oil spill hit. So what we did is use the collections behind the scenes at museums like this. Behind the scenes here are almost a million jars of fishes. And each one is a data point. And each red fish here represents a fish in a jar at some museum. And we use those to represent the different populations relative to where the spill is. And the spill is represented in green here, the 16 weeks of that oil spill. So with that, we got an idea of where populations were relative to the spill. And we found an interesting fact. Half of the species that were found only in the Gulf of Mexico, the endemics, had populations in the region of the spill. 
So for us, that was a, an incredible fact how much of the, the really rare species, the endemic species, were found in the spill zone. And again, those were based on museum specimens. And so is this exhibit, this exhibit that we called Crude Life, that we've been rolling around different museums the last few years, are based on specimens from the Gulf, from information from museums. And that's the power of what these exhibits can, can do. I think you've heard many of the speakers talk about that today. We take this uh, exhibit not just to museums, but out into the Gulf and tell people about these other fishes that they might not know about that aren't sport fish. These are my adorable children, by the way. I'll just give them a shout out. So very telling for me about how little we know about the Gulf is, again, based on exhibits and, and museum specimens. This is a, a heat map showing one kilometer by one kilometer squares of different areas in the Gulf. Blue areas have no records of any vertebrate that are in any museum. Yellow is one to 10, and then you slowly get darker near the shore. But this could be a bird observation, it could be anything. Once you go below the surface, almost everything turns blue again, and not the good blue. One small project that I've been working with is called Deep Ends, and this is Tracy Sutton here who leads this project. And they've been trying to uh, fix this problem of, of how unknown the Gulf is. And they sample from zero to 1,500 meters, meters, the mesopelagic zone that we know so little about. They've actually discovered 12 new species from these trips. They also told me that since 2011, there's this been this incredible decrease in number of fish individuals that they've collected relative to uh, pre-spill. What really shocked me, though, is, is Tracy told me a few weeks ago that people are now applying for commercial permits to collect in this mesopelagic zone. And I said, you know, what do people want? No one's going to eat these little tiny little lanternfish and, and anglerfishes from this region. And he said they're doing it to get cheap sources of protein for cat food, for feeding tunas to stock tunas to get them bigger. And I thought, wow, we're, we're already getting commercial permits for this region that we barely started finding new species in. We, we hardly know it ourselves before we're exploiting it. But to be honest, I, I don't really blame those commercial interests. It looks like a vast world, a boundless sea with endless depths. But we know it's not. And so I like to kill this big ocean myth. Of course it's big, but it's finite. It's something that we need to protect. It's something that we need to study, and it's something we need to save. So let's do that. Thank you.